We've been doing a, a series on the Holy Spirit. Uh, the, we talked last week, four instances of the baptism of the Holy Spirit found in the book of Acts. We talked about Pentecost, Samaria, uh, Cornelius, and the other uh, Gentile uh, believers that were gathered with him. And then Ephesus, there was some, a group at Ephesus. And what we saw with the, was the baptism of the Holy Spirit was actually a separate event than salvation. John the Baptist said, Jesus, the, he's talking about Jesus. He said, he is coming. He said, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And so he talked about the baptism. We've talked about three baptisms. You remember those three. They are the baptism into the body of Christ, the baptism in water, and then the baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so last week we also began to talk about um, three of the four instances involved tongues. And we begin to talk about the reason for controversy when it comes to tongues, depending on how you, how you grew up, how you've been raised. Uh, I was actually raised in a Baptist church and until my mom got baptized in the Holy Spirit in the early 70s in what they call the charismatic revival. It was a huge revival that took place, took place all over the nation. And people were coming out of all kinds of denominational churches. And I mean, they were coming from, and actually started uh, a, a big move of it started in the Catholic church. And it started the Catholic church. It spread to Episcopal and Lutheran and Presbyterian and Baptist. And it was a, it was a big move, 60s, late 60s, 70s. And my mom got filled with the spirit in, in the 70s, early 70s, and spoke with other tongues. and was so excited about it. Started sharing it with her junior high girls at the, in the Baptist church uh, that she was teaching a Sunday school class. And that ended our relationship with that Baptist church as, <laughs> as, uh, as I recall being kind of uh, given the left foot of fellowship. And so um, <laughs> tongues is, is a little controversial. Now, here's, here's why it's, con we talked about why it's controversial. Uh, one of them is the passed away theology. You say, well, all that passed away. Uh, not enough scripture for that. Here, here's why I always encourage people. Many of you have been taught different things, or you, maybe you've heard nothing about this. I always encourage people, you want to find scriptures for what you believe. People say, well, you know, I don't, I don't believe that. Well, why? Or I believe that. Well, why? You always want to have scriptures for what you believe. And so we talked about, really, there not being enough scripture to, to give that passed away theology in any headway. Uh, we think fear is, is involved in it. People have met weird, spirit-filled people and think, oh my gosh, if, if, if I open my life up to the Holy Spirit, I'm going to become weird also. And um, that's not true. And we, we, you already know the, the story behind that. They were weird before the Holy Spirit came into their life. And so um, that's, that's not a fun. But people are afraid or they're afraid of losing control. So a lot of things is what you're not up on, you're down on. Here's one of the biggest challenges is... is the enemy will do anything he can to cause division. If you, if you look around now, I, I think division is one of the biggest problems we're dealing with as a nation. And it's one of the problems we deal with, uh, we'll deal with in the church. Maybe you've had something like this happen. Maybe you're, you're pushing your cart in HEB one day and you bump in, to, I mean, you're not paying attention and you run up behind somebody and bump into them. And you go, oh, I am so sorry. They go, oh, no, praise God, I'm, I'm good. And you go, oh, praise God. Praise God, you're a believer? Yeah, I'm a believer. Isn't the Lord good? He's good. The Lord is good. And you have great fellowship until what question is asked? What church do you go to? Man, you can be talking, sharing, have, just talking about the Lord, just having a great time. And they go, hey, what church do you, do you go to? And you go, well, they say, well, I go to this church, and they say, what church do you go to? I go, I go to the ark. And both of you kind of go, oh. <laughs> and the fellowship's over. <laughs> and isn't that a shame? Because the big arch that we all should be under is, if Jesus is your Lord, you're my brother or sister in Christ. Amen. That's the big arch. Yes. And honestly, guys, in a world that's so divided, the church should be a picture of unity. I, I'm, I'm really blessed by this church because we are a highly diverse church. I tell people, if you can't find somebody that you fit with, you're not looking hard. 
because we've got all kinds of demographics involved in our church. A sociologist would have a field day in our church because <laughs> we're, we're not all the same. If you notice that, we're not all the same. And we've got different races. We've got different economic strata. We've we got, we got a lot of good data here. And, um, I, you know, I, and, and I love that. I, and it's, but it should be, and, and I believe you guys do a good job, it should be a picture of unity in a divided world where they could come in and see all different kinds of people united under one thing. We love the Lord. We appreciate Him. We appreciate what He's done for us. And it, I really believe more and more and more, we've got to have a difference between us and the secular world. And this, but division is one of the enemy's greatest tools. And it goes back away. Now I told you last week that I would share with you uh, something the Lord really shared with me along these lines. It was years ago. It really helped me. It's actually a lesson from the Old Testament. There were, uh, when Moses was sent to the nation of, back to Egypt, remember he, he helped deliver the nation of Israel out of Egypt. The nation of Israel had been slaves for about 400 some years and Egypt had held them in slaves. They were very oppressed and they cried out to God and he sent Moses. And remember Moses went back and he asked Pharaoh, he said, let my people go. And Pharaoh wouldn't do it. And the Lord judged Egypt and they had 10 plagues. There was some ugly plagues that hit and they had some plagues. And finally, after that last plague, which was uh, firstborn in, in all the house of Egypt and even in their animals died. And it, it was a bad job, except in the, in the nation of Israel where they had, remember, blood on the doorpost. And it was called Passover. That's where we get Passover. So here comes, here comes Moses and the whole nation out of, they come out of Egypt, they go through the Red Sea, they, they go through the, uh, they go all the way up to the promised land, have all kinds of adventures getting there. They go through the, they get to the promised land and the people balk at going into the promised land because God said, I've given you the land. And even though they sent 12 spies in to kind of check the land out, when they came back, they said, they said, there are, there are giants there. There are huge people. There are walled cities. We can't take it. And the people got very discouraged. And the people began to, begin to cry. They cried all night. And they said, let's go back to Egypt. Let's pick someone. And if you remember the story, it, it's sad. They came right up to the edge of the promised land. And then they could not go in. And it wasn't God's fault. He said they wouldn't do it. They wouldn't believe him. And so they wandered in the desert 40 years. God took care of them. But they're wandering, they're wandering. Now, they're getting ready to go back into the promised land. Now, they're going to, well, it's not quite they're getting ready to go back in. But before they're getting ready to go back in, two tribes come to Moses. And they say, you, you know what? We're happy where we are. Let's read what happened to them. The children of Gad and the children of Reuben, that are, that, those are two of the tribes of Israel came and spoke to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the leaders of the congregation, saying, The country which the Lord defeated before the congregation of Israel is a land for livestock, and your servants have livestock. Therefore, they said, If we have found favor in your sight, let this land be given to your servants as a possession. Do not take us over the Jordan. And Moses said to the children of Gad and to Reuben, the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war while you sit here? Now, why will you discourage the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land which the Lord is giving them? So you got two tribes. They weren't the biggest. They were kind of in the middle. And they said, oh, we've got livestock. We're happy. The promised land was across the Jordan. But they said, no, we don't, we don't want to go there. We're good. We're, we're good right here where we are. We like this land. We have livestock. Every tribe had livestock. They just decided, we're going to stay right here. We don't even want to go into the promised land. And Moses was not having it. He said, let me tell you something. He, and it, I'll, I'm giving you the, the short version. He said, this is what happened when, when they came to the edge of the promised land the first time. And people discouraged the hearts of the children of Israel. And they turned away from following God. He said, you don't want to do that. He said, don't, he said, don't do that. So they, they actually had to reach a compromise. He said, you, you can't discourage the heart of your brethren. And so this is what happened. Go ahead. They came near and said to him, okay, we're going to build sheepfolds here for our livestock and cities for our little ones. 
but we ourselves will be armed, ready to go before the children of Israel until we have brought them into their place and our little ones will dwell in fortified cities because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until every one of the children of Israel has received his inheritance. You say, well, what's the whole purpose of that? It's a pretty powerful purpose. And it's this. Gad and Reuben did not go into the promised land. They said, we are happy where we are right here. They said, but we're not going to discourage the hearts of our brothers. We want them to have their promised land too, so we will help them go and fight. That was the agreement. Now here's the principle. When we start sharing things like baptism of the Holy Spirit, healing, provision, being led by the Spirit, depending on how you've been raised or what you believe, some of you may go, mm -mm, I don't want that. I'm happy right where I am. I'm happy right here. Uh, you know, baptism of the Holy Spirit, no, no, don't want it. Speaking in tongues, no, nope. don't want that. And that's okay because we're not going to force you. We're not going to think bad about you. That's really between you and the Lord. But you don't discourage anybody else. If someone says, oh, man, at the ark, they were talking about being filled with the Spirit, and I'm so excited because I've always, I've always wanted to do that in my prayer life. Don't you look at them and go, that, that's of the devil. Don't do it. <laughs> don't discourage their heart. You say, is that important? Yeah, it's important. When Joy got sick about 30 some years ago, she had acute chronic pancreatitis, it was bad. We could lose her. And we had some friends that our kids played together, they were believers, they were, they were, they were close to us, we were close to them, we got together all the time. And for some reason, now they had been raised where healing was not for us today and healing had been passed away. We're believing God that, that my wife is not going to die with a 10-year-old, 7-year-old, and, and a 3-year-old. We're, 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 we're trusting the Lord. Actually, no, Michael's newborn, wasn't he? Michael was a newborn. So I had a 10-7 and newborn. And so I, I'm, I'm, I've been taught, thank God, that Jesus is a healer. That Jesus still works miracles. So I don't want any miracles. It won't happen to you. Don't worry. But I... But, <laughs> but, we believe that my wife did not have to die with that. And so we're doing everything we can to believe God. This lady was doing everything she could to talk Joy out of believing God for healing. She was telling her to get passed away, that Joy should be happy with what she had. And she, was, she would actually send her articles about people who did not get healed. And articles about people who died with what she had. So I did a very Christian-like thing. I said, you may not come in this house anymore. I, I just told her, I said, we cut that relationship off. It's a shame. We didn't have to do it. But if you're going to discourage my wife's heart, for, and by the way, my wife is good. And the Lord healed her and she's, and she's well. Um, but if you're going to discourage my, you don't have to do that. Well, I don't believe in that. But you don't have to discourage anybody else. I had a guy come and have dinner with us one time. This was, I was right out of Bible school. I've been on the other side of this. I, I, I hurt this. I hurt this guy. He started talking about how he had, he had lost his, his dad. And uh, in his mind, he said, that, you know, the Lord took his dad. And he was grappling with that. And I took it upon myself to tell him that his, his doctrine was wrong. And I began to tell him where it wasn't the Lord and... and he wasn't, he wasn't even open to hearing that. You know what I should have simply said? Brother, I'm sorry. It's tough to lose a dad. That's all that needed to be said. Now, if we maybe had a relationship and I could share some different things, maybe it would have helped him, maybe not. Here's my point. Whatever, wherever you are, don't discourage somebody else. Wherever you are, you, do, you want your brothers and sister in Christ to go on, to get stronger, to be blessed. When I talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, let me, I'm, I'm going to say this, I'm going to keep saying this. We have too many things going on right now in our country. This is not a problem. People getting filled with the Spirit and speaking in tongues, that's not a problem. Racial division, gender confusion, 
anxiety, depression, the political identity problem. Those are problems. Being filled with the Spirit, not a problem. Being filled with God, not a problem. Praying in a prayer language, not a problem. Are you listening to me? This is, this is, we've got to come to the place. It's like, well, you know, so-and-so, they go to another church. Listen, if they love Jesus, they're family. And you might be living next to them in heaven, so you might as well learn to get along with them right now. <laughs> but the idea is, don't, don't, make it, don't make it an issue. So I'm, I'm going to talk this evening about the wonderful gift of a prayer language. I'm going to give you some scriptures. We're going to go through and say, well, I don't believe in that. Well, you're about 42 years too late for me. So listen, listen to these scriptures because I, I will give you some scriptures. I have experience and actually I have data that the fastest growing segment of the church in the world is the segment of the church that believes in this. It's fastest growing in the nation. It's the fastest growing worldwide. And so what we're, what we're having is people are hungry for more of God in their life. And they're, they're hungry for going, God, I, we need more of God. Do you, do you not think as a country we need more of God? Yes. Do you not think that we need more? If you're, thinking, if you're thinking that we're better off now than we were 50 years ago from a moral and a spiritual standpoint, you're kidding yourself. You're kidding. Guys, days are not getting brighter. They're getting darker. So, Alan, that's kind of gloom and doom. No, I'm, listen, I'm praying. I'm believing that, that God can send a move of God, a revival, something that can awaken this nation and change things. That's what we're praying for. We pray for that every week here as a church. We're praying for that. Why? Because we know we need God to do something because we're not going down good roads. So let's talk a little bit about a, the wonderful benefit of a prayer language. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 2. He who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. Now, that word mysteries is hidden secrets, but it's not hidden to God. Speaking to God is prayer. So it's in the spirit. That means it's beyond this realm. Speaking mysteries are things that are hidden, but not to God. And it's speaking directly to God. It's not meant for other people. So it's speaking directly to him. Praying in a tongue is where we get the term prayer language, 1 Corinthians 14, 4 through, 14 through 15. Now, a lot of this is right out of Corinthians because <laughs> the Corinthian church was a pretty wild and woolly church. They were the Las Vegas of their day. And uh, they were, man, they had, they had temple worship. They had promiscuity was just like, that was part of their culture. I mean, they were, what happened in Corinth needed to stay in Corinth because it was, it, was, it was a wild town. And so these believers are coming in. And if you'll notice, because we're reading, because all of us are reading Project, our Bible 365. And so we're all reading in, in 1 Corinthians, right? We're, all, we're, all, we're okay. So this church has got issues. I mean, you had a guy that stole his, 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 his stepmom away from his dad and they were sleeping together. And you had, oh, I mean, church had issues. I'm so glad you guys are not like that. But we, we, had, we had issues there. So he said, and they were, they were big on, on, on the gifts of the spirit, but they were out of order. He said, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the spirit and I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the spirit and I will sing with the understanding. He's given, he's given us a contrast here. Praying with the spirit, praying with the understanding. What is praying with the understanding? That's praying with your, with your knowledge, what you know. If I'm praying for you, I, I might pray, Father, help them, strengthen them, give them wisdom about the days ahead, give them understanding. So I'm praying in English, but a lot of times when we pray for you guys, I don't, you know, I don't know all of you. I, I see you sometimes out in public and y'all go, y'all look at me like, we go to the church. Do you, do you know our name? I'm like, no. <laughs> no. Love you. Don't know your name. But, but I've prayed for you. How have I prayed for you? Prayed in the Spirit. You all want me to stop? <laughs> okay. Well, that's just it's a good thing. So I don't know everything, but the Holy Spirit does. So l l listen to this. My spirit prays. My understanding is unfruitful. The Holy Spirit enables us to pray beyond our understanding. 
This is key. Romans 8, 26. For the Spirit, likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The words groanings which cannot be uttered, the word groanings is articulate speech. The Holy Spirit knows more about what's going on than we do. The Holy Spirit can help us pray. I'll give you a great example. Uh, a number of years ago, Michael was in high school. He called me. I was up here at the church. It was a Friday night. He said, Dad, can I go to this game? I think it was a, 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 a game up in Willis. And uh, I said, sure. Football game or something. I said, sure. Go ahead and go. And he, um, I said, did you check with your mom? Yeah, mom's okay. And so he left. And I, boy, something didn't feel right. You ever just had something that you know is wrong? But you don't know what to do about it. So you can start praying. You can run down the list. God bless grandma, God bless grandpa, God bless dad. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on. I knew something was happening and something wasn't right. And so I, I just stopped and I began to say, Lord, I said, I don't know what's happening, but I, I just, since I need to pray, and I begin to pray in the spirit and I'm praying in the spirit. You say, well, did you understand what you were praying? No, the Bible said my understanding is unfruitful. I am trusting, this is a faith thing. I am trusting that the Holy Spirit is helping me pray for a situation. Amen. Come to find out later, Joy had the very same thing. And she's praying for the situation. And so we prayed for a while, then I sensed, okay, we're okay. And when we get home, Michael tells me, he shows me the car. He had his sister's um, Camry. Remember those Camrys that kind of like that light brown color? There's like a million of them. And uh, it wasn't an attractive car. If you had one, I apologize, but it wasn't an attractive car. <laughs> I think all teenagers need an ugly car. Just uh, that's the... <laughs> Because, because he, he embellished it. And, and, and evidently when he was getting onto the freeway, he hit the wheel of an 18 wheeler on the side and you could see the imprint of the wheel on the side. He never lost control and was able to, to get safely to the game and safely back. You say, well, is that what you were praying about? That's what I believe we were praying about. I didn't know it was going on, but the Holy Spirit, who is our helper, knows what's happening. Amen. And so he's helping us pray. We don't know what to pray for as we ought. He helps us pray. And so that is, boy, that is such a, such a key thing. He's the one that has a perfect understanding. Here's the third thing. Praying in the Spirit is supernatural evidence of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. This is actually how the early church made the determination that the Gentiles could even be saved. When Peter went into and began to preach to Gentiles, this is what happened. He's preaching Jesus to them. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all of those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, that means the Jewish people who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And so this was actually what Peter used when they called him on the carpet. And they said, the, the Jewish leaders called him on the carpet. They said, I can't believe you went in, you went into Gentiles and you, you were sharing the gospel with Gentiles. And Peter said, hey, this is what happened. And I'm just preaching, I'm just telling them about Jesus and the Holy Spirit fell on them just like he did us at the beginning. He said, who was I that I could fight against God? And so what they saw was when they saw them speak with other tongues, they went, oh my gosh, that's the same thing we got on the day of Pentecost. And it was able, they were able to make that transition. And so that was a key thing for helping them come out of that. Praying in the Spirit is a super, so it's the supernatural evidence of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. Not the only evidence, but it is a supernatural evidence. Here's a, be here's a beautiful thing. It builds us up spiritually. 1 Corinthians 14, 4. He who speaks in a tongue edifies that word Edifies means to build up or charge himself. He who prophesies edifies the church. Prophecy is a, is a word given that's inspired and it blesses the church. He said, he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself. It puts our spirit, it's like charging a battery. It puts our spirit in direct contact with God. It enables us to live an overcoming life and be a help. This is something that, that I think is, is one of the benefits we don't talk about enough. Staying built up spiritually is enabling us to deal with some of the temptations and deal with some of the stuff in life. Now you're saying, now, Alan, I, I know spirit-filled people, they don't live any different than, than, you know, than me, and 
I'm not spirit filled, so I, I don't think it's the deal. And I've heard people say, yeah, if you're not spirit filled, you're not going to be able to live an overcoming life. No, listen, living an overcoming life is we do that by faith. But understand that the Holy Spirit is a helper. He helps. He's not the doer. There's a difference. Matt, would you help me? Just for a second. I, I, I need to move this just a little bit over. It's a little center. I need to move it. Would you help me move it? This way? Yep. Okay. Well, now, stop. Did he help me? Yes. This is a trick question, all right? Did, 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 did he help me? Yes. No. He did it. Did I help? Did, was I? Let's move it back. Now, did he help me? Yes. yes. Thank you, Matt. You were a help. <laughs> People thought the, the Holy Spirit's not going to do it for us. He's going to help us. But that means our effort's going to be involved. If we're going to live a life that's free from sin, if we're going to live a life that's consecrated and dedicated to God, guys, we have to be the ones that we're going to resist the enemy. We're going to resist temptation. We're going to do our best. He will help us do it. He will not do it for us. Amen. So does that make sense now? Yes. You know what it is, is now we live in such a polite society that if someone says, hey, can you help me with this? And that's what y'all said. Yeah, he, he moved it. He, he helped me. But no, we need to take hold of it together. And the Holy Spirit will help us as he will build us up spiritually, just like charging a battery. There's a great verse in Jude, that's Jude 20, that said, building up yourselves on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. So again, it's, it's building, it's charging, it's building us up on our most holy faith as we pray in the Holy Spirit. So it's also part of the spiritual armor, Ephesians 6. 16, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. When you start to see in the spirit, this is praying in other tongues, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. So as we're talking about these things, understand that the Holy Spirit is sent to help us. He is sent to, to build us up to chart. But if, if we don't utilize it now, let me talk to you. Some of you, uh, I've talked with some of you and you said, you know what, Alan, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit and I, I prayed in the Spirit and I haven't done it since. I want to encourage you to go back and pick that up again. Now, I got baptized in the Holy Spirit when I was 19. I was out selling books door to door, prayed with some people. First, they sent me to a, a Pentecostal group. Man, that was interesting. <laughs> I invited my, well, I invited myself, honestly, I met a Pentecostal family. They were going to a meeting. I was just so hungry for God. I said, can I go? And they looked at me because I wasn't dressed right. And they let me go and I sat in the back. Everyone was dressed. Real, I was kind of dressed too casually. And uh, they invited, you know, so at the end, I don't remember the guy said, I remember he yelled a lot. And, I, and at the end, I came down to receive the Holy Spirit. And they said, well, we'll kneel down right here, hard, hard floor. And uh, I'm kneeling down and I, First guy said, brother, you need to let go. So I'm just sitting there with my arms raised, looking like this, letting go of whatever I didn't had to hold on. I didn't know what I had a hold of, but I'm letting it go. And so I, I let go for a while, and that wasn't working. And then the hold on brother came. So he said, brother, you need to hold on. So whatever I was letting go of, I now needed to hold on. <laughs> and I held on for a while, and that didn't work either. So I finally got up, and I finally said, well, I just... This is going to be a long ordeal. And I, I, I went back and uh, knocking on doors. I met another uh, couple and uh, they invited me to come back. The ladies, he said, my husband be home after six, come back. And I came back and they prayed and I received. So I'm, ni I'm 19. I received the Holy Spirit. I was so excited. I went back to college. Now listen to me. I've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, the helper. Immersed in the Holy Spirit, the helper. I was praying in the Spirit. I went back there but I didn't have a good church. I didn't read my Bible. I didn't have any Christian fellowship. Those are three things that will absolutely suck the life out of you spiritually. All my friends were party friends. 
When I got back, they cranked the bong up the moment I walked in the door. It was four o'clock in the morning when I came in late. They're like, Alan's back, let's party. And the very first day I'm back, I'm high going to class. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna do that. But, but then I didn't have a good church. I didn't get in God's word. I wasn't praying, I wasn't fellowshipping. And I fell farther and farther away from God. This is why I have such a heart for people who make a decision and they get away from God. But I got good news for you. You can come back. Amen. Got great news. You can come back. But for three years, I didn't pray in tongues at all. And when I came back and you know the story of me meeting joy and I came back to the Lord. Well, I thought, okay, I had been living so bad. I lost it. Whatever I had, I had the Holy Spirit, but I've lost it. I didn't lose it. Someone prayed with me, I immediately began to pick it up. See, here's what I'm saying. If you prayed in the Spirit once, you can do it again. Say, not now, but when you go home, just get by yourself. Say, Lord, I'm going to dedicate whatever. I'm just going to dedicate this to you. And just begin to, and begin to develop that again. You can do it. So I, I just felt really particularly impressed to tell some of you who did that as a one-time experience. It's not meant to be a one-time experience. It's meant to keep you built up spiritually to keep your batteries charged. How many of you know you can get low spiritually, but you can also charge up? And so I'd encourage you to do that. Just pick it up and go again, begin to pray in the spirit again. It is part of the spiritual armor. It is, it is a help, it is a blessing. It um, helps us pray in line with God's perfect will. We already read that, that verse in Romans, the eighth chapter. We're limited in our understanding, but he helps us. And it also keeps selfishness out of our prayers. Now, I'll tell you what, what I will do a lot of times is Joy and I pray when we pray for you and we pray and our, and our team prays for you and, and our staff prays for you. And again, listen, guys, it, you say, well, do you have to pray in the spirit to come to this church? No, no. We have staff that doesn't. But we just tell them when you come to staff prayer, we're going to pray. And, and we pray in the spirit. We pray in English, but then we pray in the spirit. One of the prayers I pray for you is that God would fill you with the knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you would walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power for all perseverance and long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks to God. Giving Amen. thanks. I pray that for you. I pray that. Now, how many know there's people in here that I don't know? And you're thinking, that's exactly how I'm going to keep a preacher. You're not going to know me. No. no. There are people in here I do not know. But guess who does know you? Jesus. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit, does he know about you? Yes. You, and, so, I, and so we should pray for the church. I don't know everything that's going on with you, but I can pray. And we can begin to pray in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, who helps my weaknesses, he helps the fact that I don't know you, but he can help me pray. And Joy and I pray, and we've got a team. Now we've got people to come up here and pray. And one of the biggest ways we pray is we pray in the Spirit for you. And that enables us to pray. Now here's, one, here's another benefit. This is just, it enables us to pray for a while. You ever prayed for an hour? It's challenging, isn't it? Praying in the Spirit for an hour is a whole lot better. Because you, you get beyond your mind. Well, if I can't understand it, I, I don't, no, no, no. This is where we trust the Lord. This is where we trust that the Holy Spirit within us can help us pray. So, oh, don't get nervous, guys. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to lock the doors. We're, we're, we're going to we're, we're be good. I, I want you to do this, though. I really, if you're interested, I want you to start going over these scriptures. And if you're honest, if you ask God, Lord, show me these things. Show me how. Because here's the last thing. Uh, last scripture, if you put it up. If you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks? Since he does not understand what you say, for indeed you give thanks well, but the other's not edified. Hang, hang, leave, leave it up there. This is what I was talking about the Corinthians. Corinthians, and I'll, I'm going to talk in a few weeks about the gifts of the Spirit. Because there's, there's, a, there's a difference. But the Corinthian church, these guys, someone say, would you bless the food? They would just stand up pray real loud in the spirit and then sit down. And Paul said, um, how is anyone who's listening to you going to say amen at your giving thanks? 
You just, you just prayed in tongues. He didn't, he didn't know, no one knows what you just said. He said, he doesn't understand. For you, in, he said, but you indeed give thanks well. He said, what you've done is you've given thanks well, but the other person is not edified. What Paul kept trying to get them, these folks to do is to, is to be conscious of other people. That you don't want to just use your gifts and just, just blare out stuff and other people have no idea what's going on. So if you, if you get filled with the Spirit, don't show up at your family function and go, I'm going to say the blessing and just crank it out. And, and, and that's not going to bless anyone because you've got a lot of people who were uninformed. They don't know what's going on. Now, if, you, if the whole family is filled with the Spirit, you can all join in. But the idea is we've got to think about other people, but it's a great way to worship God. Amen. And it's a great way to give thanks to Him. So, some good benefits. Look up the Scriptures. So, I'm, I, don't know. I don't want that. Listen, guys, I, 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 keep, I can't emphasize this enough. We love you, and you're welcome to come to this church whether you agree with everything we say or not. But the deal is, find scriptures for what you believe. If you come to me and go, I don't believe it, why? You gotta have scriptures. You gotta have scriptures for what you stand on. You gotta have scriptures. You need something more than just, I hope so, or what tradition says. You need the solid word of God that gives you a foundation for life, and it'll help you. Amen. Now, we love you. You don't have to duck me. We're not gonna, I'm not gonna come running through and lay hands on you. We're not going to shake you and make you speak in tongues. There are no snakes up here anywhere at all. <laughs> but I believe we're big enough as a church that we should be able to give you things that will help you and things that can be a benefit to your spiritual life. And then you make up your own mind. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit who empowers us, enables us, and Father, it helps us go way beyond what we can do on our own. Thank you for that. And Father, I thank you for those who have come tonight. Thank you for those who are watching online. I ask that you would minister to them and speak life and, and grace to them. Father, for those who have known you in the past and are hungry for you, thank you for illuminating these scriptures. But Father, for those that don't know you, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the grace that's in him. His heads are bowed, knives are closed. If you came this evening and said, Alan, I, know, I don't even understand about the Holy Spirit, so I don't have a relationship with the Lord, but I want to. Or maybe you're saying, I had a relationship with the Lord. I've gotten away from Him, and I want to come back. Would you pray for me? We're going to do that. I'm going to ask you not to stand up, not to come to the front, but just real quickly slip your hand up if that's you, and you say, would you, would you pray for me? Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Appreciate that. Anybody else? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Go ahead, let's pray this prayer together. We're going to pray it with you as a church family. Say, Dear God, I know mankind needs a Savior. I know I can't save myself. Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And God raised you from the dead. Right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior is the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I've said yes to you. Amen. If you pray that prayer with us online, there's a, there's a scan there. If you're here, there's a scan or there's a card right by your feet. Do not forget your children. They're outside. <laughs> They're wet. They're waiting for you. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. We love you guys. Praying for you. Have a great one.